Alrighty, friends, we are almost live. Okay, welcome back to another Metabolic Monday. We're going to talk about one of the most fascinating studies that I've read in a very long time. It was a study comparing biomarkers in similarly aged individuals uh, compared to individuals who reached their 100th birthday comparing those who did not. And it was a study involving over 44,000 subjects. About 2.7% of these subjects were tracked over 30 years, made it to their 100th birthday. And in today's show, we're going to talk a little bit more about this study. I just want to thank you and welcome you all back. And I think this is incredibly fascinating because what these researchers actually did is they looked at common biomarkers and they found strong associations between the levels of these biomarkers and the probability of reaching 100 years of age. Now, this is a very interesting study because we don't really see studies like this very often. We might see an association over the course of five years with an elevation in a certain biomarker or blood test, and that's that, that correlates with the onset of a disease. But this study actually looked at death and the odds of reaching 100 years of age, and I think this is just incredibly fascinating. Now, you might be wondering, Mike, What's up with your camera? Well, as you might be able to tell, I'm actually just recording this from my uh, Zoom camera. My other camera just decided to poop out on me. So we are up close and personal. I'm right here on my desktop, and we are going to go through some of these incredibly interesting studies uh, and findings from this study. And what you might think is quite interesting is common biomarkers that you would suggest or suspect would be linked with the onset of disease were correlated with the odds of not reaching your 100th birthday. Now, lest I remind you, this was a data set out of Sweden, again, in tracking biomarkers using this Amoris cohort out of Sweden, which stands for the apolipoprotein mortality risk cohort, the Amoris cohort. It looked at labs of 44,000 subjects and found just incredibly interesting results and findings. Again, if you're enjoying the content, hit that like button. Be sure to leave a comment in the comment section below. I'd like to get back to all your comments as we go along here. Sorry for the uh, the uh, little delay there. There was an issue getting my getting my computer all dialed in. Okay, so here we go. Let's uh, let's look at this actual study. This is just incredibly interesting. So I'm gonna clear my desktop and uh, let's dive into it. I, I just think this is just really a fascinating study. Okay, so here's the study that we're talking about here. The title of the study is Blood Biomarker Profiles and Exceptional Longevity Comparison of Centenarians and Non-Centenarians in a 35-Year Follow-Up Swedish, uh, uh, the Amoris Cohort, which is the apolipoprotein risk analysis that I was sharing with you earlier. I'm going to clear this layer. Uh, excuse me. There. Okay. So this was the actual uh, study. Now, here's what I think is just right off the bat. Really interesting. Only 2.7% of the participants reached their 100th birthday. Now, what the studies uh, subjects and investigators wanted to see actually from the study subjects is what are the statistical associations, if any, with common biomarkers, and how does that correlate with the odds of reaching 100 years of age? Now, that is what they are looking at. Now, here's what's really interesting. Non-centenarians had roughly double or triple the rates of various common conditions. So, the centenarians here, uh, in, in what you're seeing here on the screen here, you can see my cursor. These are the centenarians here, and this is just the percentage of all the subjects that have these different conditions. We have right here, myocardial infarction, so having a heart attack. So if you look here, it's roughly double or actually uh, four times the prevalence of a heart attack in individuals uh, who did not reach their 100th birthday. Now, it doesn't show the direction of causality here, but we can ascertain that underlying cardiovascular disease dramatically decreases your health span and your lifespan. Now, as you can see here, congestive heart failure. There's actually a five-fold increase in the prevalence of congestive heart failure. Uh, we have cerebrovascular disease over here, and we have all sorts of other conditions, including cancer. And so essentially, what these uh, investigators found is the prevalence of these different conditions is significantly lower uh, in the in the centenarians. And so that speaks to the fact that living to age 100 is not just by happenstance, by chance, or you have good genes. It's probably a, a complex interaction between genetics, lifestyle, and environment, as well as mindset, relationships, all the other ancillary factors that prevent disease. But that's really important to acknowledge 
that there were dramatic differences in the prevalence of cardiovascular disease and metabolic metabolic related diseases. So I just want to make sure that we're we're here live. We're doing good. How's the audio? Let me know, my friends. Again, my other camera is kind of pooping out. So we're here on the desktop. I'm about to go to the gym. That's why I have a uh, my shirt on like this. But let's get back into it and just just continue to dive in to this incredibly interesting uh, study here. Again, this is the largest study and the first study of its kind to make statistical associations with common biomarkers and associate that with the odds of reaching your 100th birthday. The scientists say, we found that a higher total cholesterol level was associated with a higher chance of becoming a centenarian. Let me just read that one more time because you have been told by your doctor, by the media, by public health officials that cholesterol is bad. I just want to read this sentence one more time from the largest ever study evaluating biomarkers of centenarians compared to age-matched individuals who did not reach their 100th birthday. We found that a higher total cholesterol level was associated with a higher chance of becoming a centenarian. Now, isn't that quite interesting? We have been told over and over and over again that cholesterol is a bad thing. Blood cholesterol clogs your arteries like the old plumber uh, pipe model. You know, the more junk in the tubes, the higher chances you're going to have a heart attack. But as you can see here again, like we talked about, not only do the scientists show that centenarians have roughly one-fifth the rate of having a myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular disease, and congestive heart failure. Yet, as they just say, and they found in their statistical analysis, the TC here stands for total cholesterol. So, higher total cholesterol is increases the probability that this cohort that was tracked for 30 years will live to one, their 100th birthday. So, I want you to just remember this. Next time you go to the doctor, and your doctor is very concerned about your cholesterol, I would like you to take a screenshot of the study, print out the study. And I think it is important to acknowledge that cholesterol is not the boogeyman that needs to be lowered to uh, at all costs. And we know there are consequences and side effects and memory loss and musculoskeletal challenges linked with all sorts of cholesterol-lowering medications. Now, let's go back to glucose. This is interesting. We've talked a lot about the problems with hyperglycemia and insulin resistance associated with hyperglycemia. But wait, what do you see? You see here, non-centenarians have significantly higher levels of blood glucose compared to centenarians. Now, again, this probably speaks to lifestyle. This speaks to dietary choices. This speaks to underlying metabolic health. Now, because we know that centenarians do not have the same prevalence of the common non-communicable diseases, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's, and the like, compared to their non-centenarian counterparts, uh, it makes sense that, that having a lower blood glucose would increase the probability of reaching your 100th birthday. Now, going on, here's what I think is even more fascinating. Let's focus right here on GGT. We've talked a lot about this in the Bloodwork Masterclass. The acronym for this particular biomarker is gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. And I'll just break this down real quick. So GGT is one of your three liver function tests. For some reason, many medical doctors and, and standard mainstream practitioners do not include this on your routine physicals, your Chem 24, your CBC and differential. And that's why I do recommend over at our website, highintensityhealth.com, you download the free blood work masterclass cheat sheet over at highintensityhealth.com. Just download that. On page one are all the tests that I recommend including in your annual physical and when you do your labs and especially looking at this liver enzyme. Now, this is important because GGT reflects the turnover of glutathione in your body. So it does make sense that if you have a high demand for glutathione because you're maybe a smoker, you live an unhealthy lifestyle, you have an occupation that uh, might lend itself to increased uh, levels of persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals and you don't need organic food and all the things, then it would make sense that your uh, liver enzymes would start to increase, particularly GGT, and that would correlate uh, with higher oxidative stress. And that is, in fact, a, a finding from this study is markers of inflammation and oxidative stress for inversely correlated with the odds of reaching the 100th birthday. 
Okay. So I do just want to make sure that we're going to get your live question shortly, my friends. If you're enjoying the content, hit that like button. Thank you for being here live on a Monday. Just a quick reminder that metabolic health is really, really important. And that's why we formulated the novel Berberine Fasting Accelerator, really unique product to help curb those evening food cravings for cookies, crackers, ice cream, pizza, all the unhealthy foods that will derail your metabolic health. Berberine is a natural product that's been used for over 3,000 years in traditional Chinese medicine. Check out the many reviews over at myoscience.com. You can take two to three capsules in the evening to help curb those evening food cravings. Save with the code podcast at checkout. Okay. So going on, let's go on down the list here. Again, I, again, I think this is just so fascinating. We're going to talk more about cholesterol here in a moment. But we also need to talk about uric acid, which is listed right here. So uric acid is an indirect marker of inflammation. Now, as you can see here in the red, the, the non-centenarians tend to have significantly higher levels of uric acid compared to centenarians. And so again, because uric acid would be also a marker of fructose metabolism and absorption. So people that are consuming, say, soda pops and refined carbohydrates, processed foods and the like, you would expect their serum uric acid to start to increase. In fact, one of our past podcast guests who's been on the show numerous times now, Dr. David Perlmutter, wrote a whole book about uric acid and the problems linked with uric acid and how fructose and through its metabolism can raise uric acid. So if you do find on your blood work that your uric acid is increasing, that would be a suggestion that there's some underlying inflammation as a result of your diet and lifestyle. So that is something to keep in mind. Now, they also found that a lower total iron binding capacity. Uh, interesting though, iron in and of itself was not strongly associated with the odds of reaching your 100th birthday or not. Uh, you can see here, actually, GDT is much stronger associated with that, which is quite interesting. Uh, but let's go on here and talk about cholesterol. Remember, what the scientists found here in the 30-year study is total cholesterol levels, uh, higher total cholesterol was strongly associated with the odds of these 44,000 subjects reaching their 100th birthday. The scientists say a previous cross-sectional study compared cholesterol levels among offspring of exceptionally long-lived individuals in age-matched controls and found slightly higher cholesterol levels among the offspring than controls. Even if they could not observe the lifespans of the offspring and controls, it might, in accordance with our work, indicate that high levels, high cholesterol levels are more frequently observed among individuals predisposed to survive longer. Now, that's a polite way of saying that cholesterol might even be protective. We actually saw this with COVID-19 ICU admissions. People with lower cholesterol levels had poor survivability when they were hospitalized in the, or, or admitted to the ICU for COVID-19. So it appears that cholesterol is not the boogeyman that everyone has been uh, talking about. That's not to say that you want uh, very super physiologic levels of cholesterol, but uh, the idea that we should all drive it to the floor doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially if we're trying to optimize health span. Now, here are the different uh, parsed out data sets based upon uh, gender, based upon age. And what you see here is actually there was about 84% of the centenarians were females. Uh, so that's quite interesting. But again, you see, col you see cholesterol, higher levels being more protective, actually, especially in men over the age of 60 or uh, 70, between 75 and 84 uh, and so I think that is quite interesting. But look at glucose. Gl high glucose uh, decreases the odds of you living a, a exceptionally long life, which I think is interesting. And if we look here at GGT, let's look here, my friends. This is a very interesting uh, GGT, again, a indirect marker of oxidative stress and glutathione turnover and glutathione demand. Uh, high GGT is not helpful. Uh, so that's why, again, if you haven't looked at your liver function tests, there are three of them that you should be aware about. We have ALT, AST, GGT. I care more about ALT and GGT than AST because we know that AST can be released from the heart as well as the liver. Uh, but GGT, you should always include that. If you're getting your blood drawn, you might as well get these biomarkers. They are not expensive at all. Download the blood work cheat sheet over on our website if you uh, are so interested in all that. Okay, going on down the list, let's look at, uh, we already looked at some of these other biomarkers. And again, the other liver enzymes, the ALT and the AST, 
not so strongly associated with the, and correlated with the odds of reaching your 100th birthday, but GGT does in fact appear to be uh, significantly associated with that. So let's talk about the discussion here. Okay, the scientists say our work is to date the largest study comparing biomarker profiles measured at similar ages earlier in life among exceptionally long-lived individuals and their shorter-lived peers. We compared the biomarker profiles of centenarians to be and their shorter-lived peers, investigated, uh, investigated the association between a set of commonly measured biomarkers and the odds of becoming a centenarian, and explored how homogenous the biomarker profiles among the centenarian pro population was at earlier ages. We found that all included biomarkers except for ALT and albumin were predictive for the likelihood of reaching age 100. And that's, again, just incredibly fascinating stuff. The scientists say, in conclusion, already from age 65 onwards, a difference in commonly available biomarkers was observed between individuals who eventually became centenarians and those who did not. Higher levels of total cholesterol and iron and lower levels of glucose, creatinine, uric acid, ASC, GGT, ALP, alkaline phosphatase, total iron binding capacity, and LDH were associated with a greater likelihood of becoming a centenarian. While chance likely plays a role for reaching age 100, for example, avoiding a car accident, you know, not getting uh, head trauma from sports, things like that. You know, chance does play a role. The differences in biomarker values more than one decade prior to death suggest that genetic and or lifestyle factors reflected in these biomarker levels may also play a role for exceptional longevity. Our work to date is the largest study on this topic, also shows that centenarians had homogenous biomarker profiles, which underscores the importance of specific biomarker characteristics in research on exceptional longevity. Okay, so I want to get to your questions here and just ask your thoughts. I mean, I think this, this stuff is just interesting to me. And again, this is the largest study to date. So that's why I wanted to share it with you. Uh, but let's get to your live questions. Uh, again, I want to thank you for being here live. If you're enjoying the content, just hit that like button. That just lets me know that we should do more conversations like this. Uh, all right, let's get to the, the live questions here. Okay. Kimberly, her total cholesterol is 232. Wow. Nice. Uh, Kimberly, I would love to know your diet, your exercise uh, protocol, feeding, fasting window, and so forth. Okay. Uh, Jello says, how to improve your GGT numbers? Yeah, you know, some people just genetically have higher GGT numbers uh, than, than others. But one way to improve your GGT levels is to improve glutathione health. Uh, and so you can do that uh, by obviously reducing the oxidative stress burden in your life. And so minimizing exposure to uh, persistent organic pollutants heavy metals, mercury amalgam fillings, things like that. You got to get rid of them. Avoiding alcohol. One of the best ways to increase your GGT is to start drinking alcohol, which I do not recommend, by the way. So minimizing alcohol exposure, heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, eating organic food, minimizing uh, fertilizer and herbicides and pesticides on the food. Uh, and then you can also improve your glutathione uh, health by supplementing with N-acetyl, cysteine, and glycine. So that's another thing to consider. Um, you can look at glynac combinations, as they're called, for glycine and cysteine. Uh, I'm just looking at the chat here. It's going to be easier on my phone. Uh, forgive me that uh, for, for doing so. So that's something to consider. Um, but again, also minimizing intrahepatic fat. So fat in your liver is bad. You do not want fatty liver, my friends. You do not. So how do you reduce intrahepatic fat? Well, you improve metabolic health. Fasting exercise, low carb nutrition, not having a lot of hyper palatable processed sweets is one of the best ways to prevent fatty liver buildup. So GGT will increase when you're exposed to chemicals, but you will, it will also increase if you're getting, if you're getting intrahepatic fat from insulin resistance. Okay. Do you recommend natto natto kinase for young men? Um, yeah, I think I do like natto. Eat natto food. I, I think, you know, having miso and natto is helpful. Uh, for people that are predisposed to thick, hypercoagulable blood, uh, I think natto kinase is helpful. Um, so uh, if you're dehydrated often, you know, when you're traveling, if you're sedentary, if you have peripheral vascular disease, prediabetes, that, that could be helpful. But I think exercise is the best way to help improve blood flow and circulation. So that's what I would suggest. Um Okay. Jerry says, how can I raise my cholesterol? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, 
honestly, probably not eating so much processed foods uh, would would create a healthier cholesterol profile. I mean, this this data set would be even more interesting, and I'll just share the study that we're talking about on the screen so people can see if they're just now kind of tuning in and so forth. Um, all right, let's. Uh, I'm going to share this guy right now. Let's just uh, make it a little bit smaller so we all can see what is going on. Okay. All right. Um, now, this is not to say that you should go out and be proactive about raising your, your total cholesterol, uh, but it, it does sort of fly in the face with, uh, uh, with regards to the, the basic premise, the common knowledge that, that low cholesterol is somehow very protective. Uh, very interesting stuff. And actually, David Feldman has unearthed some of the NHANES data. This is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data here in the U.S. and, and has found that uh, higher total cholesterol is actually protective against mortality. So uh, interesting stuff here. All right. Audio is good. Uh, thank you for letting me know the audio uh, is okay. <sighs> How to raise cholesterol, stop statins. Yeah, you know, it appears that some of the benefits of statins, many pro statin doctors will tell you this, they are anti-inflammatory benefits. They are pleiotropic off-target effects independent of their cholesterol lowering properties. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um about that. So, you know, these biomarkers linked with inflammation that these scientists uh, found were associated with not uh, reaching your 100th birthday. Um, these ones uh, in particular here, uric acid and GGT, uh, all suggest that keeping inflammation low is protective. Um, so I think that's pretty fascinating. Uh, physical activity, uh, yes, can't underscore the importance of that. Okay, what's your target uric acid level in American units? That's a good question. I think I don't know, around four or five, something like that. I, what are the units? I think it's millimoles per liter uh, on uric acid. So yeah, you do see uric acid start to increase in people who have prediabetes, diabetes, eat a lot of uh, sugar and things like that. Okay. Yes, uh, moving the channel to Rumble, uh, starting to share videos there. That's a great idea. Thank you for that suggestion. Really, really uh, important uh, to, to start doing that. Okay, uh, what else? Listen to your body, think for yourself. Yes, this is true. Listen to your body, think for yourself. Okay, how do I feel about chlorophyll for detox? Um, you know, I think it would be helpful, chlorophyll, if you're going out to have sushi um, if you're eating a lot of tuna fish, for example, if you're getting your mercury amalgams removed, chlorophyll would probably be a good idea. Every single day, day in, day out, it's probably more going to bind up uh, heavy metals and positively charged uh, metals in the gastrointestinal tract. So I think just taking it preemptively all the time, maybe not the best idea. Uh, I do like NAC glycine combinations for that, um, just for for going to bed. We've shared a lot of studies on NAC glycine. I mean, if you want, I can uh, dive into to some of those uh, and kind of share with you some of that research. You know, if you if you all want to uh, really dive into that, I think I have a whole file on NAC glycine. So if you're interested, um, we we can do that. And uh, let's let's kind of move some screens around here. Uh, here we go. We are going to maximize this window and uh, look at NAC glycine. Uh, so. Really good evidence to suggest that NAC glycine combinations uh, are helpful. And here's a, a, a video that we're going to do next week all about glycine. Um, and again, so the the liver function test that we've been talking about that is elevated and inversely correlated with the odds of reaching 100 years of age is known as GGT gamma glutamyl transpeptidase. And uh, that enzyme is involved in the formation of glutathione. And one of the rate limiting amino acids to make glutathione is glycine along with with obviously uh, N-acetylcysteine or cysteine. And so uh, it turns out that glycine uh, is quite uh, helpful and protective. So I do, you know, if you're, if, I think there's more evidence to suggest that NAC glycine might be better than chlorophyll. Not that chlorophyll is bad. Chlorophyll might be something that you could take like charcoal when you're actively consuming products that might be problematic, um, you know, for, uh, with regards to heavy metals and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, great question there. So thank you for that. Uh, what other comments do we have? What should a 46 year old female cholesterol look like in your opinion? Janae, this is, there's so much inter individual variability with regards to cholesterol. I can't really say what's ideal. Um, 
I don't know, probably around 200. But but honestly, I like to look at ApoB to A1 uh, as opposed to just looking at cholesterol um, because that's going to give you a better insight about your lipoprotein health and overall metabolic health. So um, we've done a whole host of other videos about cholesterol. I would strongly suggest you just go to the recent uploads and check some of those out. A lot of good content there, but I can't really uh, tell you uh, the ideal levels because it also matters about what your triglycerides are as well. Okay. Um, are sit intervals better than hit? Uh, that's a good question. Most of the research shows that high intensity, short duration bursts are probably the best paired with resistance training. And so, um, yeah, that's why I'm wearing a cutoff to you. I'm literally about to go to the gym right after we uh, stop filming. Um, so big fan of uh, all forms of exercise, particularly explosive high intensity uh, type movements uh, there. So yeah, great, great question there. Okay, three grams of NAC, eight grams of glycine. This is Jerry Cash. Yeah, that's a hefty dose for sure. You could get away with less than half of that of each of those. But but if you if finances are not a worry of you, sure, uh, three grams of NAC, eight grams of glycine would be probably pretty good. Take it at night. It might help with your sleep. So... What other questions uh, do we have here? I was told to limit eggs and red meat and eat more grains. Yeah, Kimberly, you were given uh, 1960s uh, science. The, the available evidence suggests that dietary cholesterol has really no impact on serum cholesterol. And as you can see from the study, uh, total cholesterol is actually inversely correlated with the odds of uh, uh, reaching mortality, meaning, meaning higher cholesterol increases the odds of, of reaching your 100th birthday. Now, that's not to say that you know, if you're 30 or 40 or 50, that super high cholesterol couldn't be problematic. Uh, but it, it goes to show that over the age of 65, there is actually a protective effect of having high cholesterol, which I think is quite interesting. Okay, fast, Eddie, ideal dose of NAC daily. And is it is it okay to take if I've had previous skin cancer? Yeah, so NAC, uh, I don't know that there's any contraindications with uh, survival uh, survivability of a, of a previous onset diagnosis of cancer. Uh, again, NAC is just a prophylactic way to support glutathione health. We know glutathione is really important for all sorts of different uh, aspects of our biology. Okay, so good question there. Okay, Rose says, I love your electrolyte sticks. I purchased them when you made them available. Uh, thank you, Rose. Yeah, we are super excited about that. Very excited about the new unflavored electrolyte sticks launching in the first part of October. Um, so yeah, great, great uh, comment there. Okay, can intense physical activity raise iron levels temporarily? Yeah, I don't know about that, but I do know that a, a short-term cold can raise iron levels. So if you go and sh uh, test your iron and they're high or your ferritin is high, it might be that you are just experiencing a cold. You know, I, I actually uh, thought I had hemochromatosis one time uh, because my ferritin was quite high and it turned out that I just had a cold. Uh, and so I retested my uh, blood levels and they were you know, totally normal. So anytime you have a biomarker that's off the charts, simply go and retest that to see if it had normalized. So, you know, these tests are not perfect. It could be a laboratory error. It could be a methodology. Uh, it could be the technician left it out or didn't put it on ice or didn't spin it properly. So just retest, no big deal. Okay, North Life Hollywood, is eating red meat worth it if you can only get soy grain-fed supermarket beef? I currently only eat sardines and pasture-raised non-GMO eggs for my meat protein. So, yeah, that's a good question. So what would be the alternative to not eating, you know, conventional meat? Uh, is it beans and eggs? Is it top ramen? Is it pasta? I think that uh, conventional meat is probably going to be better than the... Uh, conventional foods that you would get at the grocery store. That's going to be my suggestion. But obviously getting closer to the source, you know, finding a local rancher, working with them, you can get the cost down to $3.99 a pound. Uh, so uh, that's what I would suggest is finding a local rancher. It's better for the environment. It's better for the community, all of that. Okay. Um, right now, I only lift weights for activity. What do you recommend to aid for the best of health? Running, boxing, yeah, a combination of hiking, running, boxing, cycling, getting on the concept to getting on the ski erg, doing some sprints outside up hills. I think that'd be awesome. 
Um, Deborah has a great question. What about triglycerides in centenarians? You know what, um, Deborah? I love the question, and I don't remember seeing triglycerides uh, in this report. So, but let's go back and look here. They, to the best of my knowledge, triglycerides weren't looked at, which is really uh, an adroit question by you and observation that triglycerides would be helpful here. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't run in this particular data set, um, to the best of my knowledge. I just donated blood to get my ferritin down. Great way to get your ferritin down. Uh, anyone who has thick, viscous blood, remember if you download our blood work cheat sheet, you have your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, your ferritin, your RDW, uh, RBC. These are all uh, indirect ways to look at blood viscosity. So donating blood if those are high, especially men, especially people on HRT or BHRT, uh, important to, to understand. So friends, was this helpful to you? Let me know by hitting that like button. That just lets me know that, that this was helpful uh, to you. Uh, again, grateful that you tuned in live. And uh, yeah, I think we might do a deeper analysis of this particular uh, video because I think it's just incredibly fascinating. So um, I'm grateful that you all tuned in. I am very grateful that uh, you found this content reasonably helpful. Uh, what I can do again, this link, this study in the in the uh, description below. If you want a fuller analysis of this and a more condensed version, I know, I know we've kind of been talking about your questions and different things. Uh, we can do that later. But um, have an awesome rest of your day. Appreciate you tuning in. Appreciate you sharing this video, hitting that like button, and we will catch you on a future live session next week. Have a great day. Bye, all. <laughs>